This is a video regarding active transport as a form of cell transport. Here you're viewing a single-celled organism called a paramecium. It is a heterotroph, and it lives in aquatic environments. And what we're seeing here, pay special attention to these structures. These are referred to as contractile vacuoles. You can see the structure uh, is a vacuole. It is a storage compartment and it has several rays that, that move out from that center region. Uh, kind of looks like little uh, cartoon sun type things. This one is clearly quite full. This one has just contracted. So watch the following clip and see how the contractile vacuole operates as the paramecium swim through their water environment. You can see the contractile vacuoles uh, enlarge, they swell up, and then they contract. And they enlarge again and contract. And what's happening here is water is moving into the cell using osmosis, and then the contractile vacuoles contract and force that water back out into the environment. Using what you know now about the contractile vacuole, use the data table, the paragraph, and answer question. The diagram we have here uh, summarizes the, the transport mechanisms we've already studied. We have diffusion, where particles are moving across the cell membrane through that hydrophobic region from high concentration to low concentration. The particles that can't make it through the membrane then have to, be bridged, have to bridge that gap using a transport protein. We refer to that as facilitated diffusion. Osmosis is a specific kind of facilitated trans, uh, diffusion. Uh, these two are summarized as passive transport, requiring no energy at all. This, however, is significantly different than that found in active transport. Look at the diagram, and then summarize what you see using the three bulleted items. And when you've done so, you should be able to define active transport. So active transport then, if you've been able to look at it properly, you'll see that it's really a movement of, mo of molecules, whether it's large or small, across the cell membrane, but this is requiring energy, and this energy of course is in the form of ATP. Uh, that is of course the cell form of energy. Uh, this often works against the concentration gradient, which means it's also moving against diffusion. Using small particles, uh, the small ones that would otherwise go through the membrane, uh, we're going to use small transport proteins, and this, in this way we're going to call them pumps. And this is, uh, examples of that include the proton pump and the sodium potassium pump, which you'll probably uh, examine later. Larger materials, though, that are far larger than any transport protein or pump could ever uh, move across the membrane, are going to have to require an entirely different mechanism. And this mechanism is, mechanism is going to require uh, an actual deformation of the membrane. Consider the moving particles through a window or through a door in your classroom versus moving an entire school bus into your classroom. There are two ways that we see this happen. The first is exocytosis, exo meaning outward. Um, here's a diagram of exocytosis where a vesicle is moving particles out of the cell. We can see that summarized here as well. Here's a vesicle fusing with the cell membrane and then particles are released out the membrane. But then the opposite direction, moving things in, is summarized as endocytosis. In this diagram we see the movement of particles um, into a pocket and then the pinching off of the membrane resulting in the formation of a vesicle. Using that, uh, here's a, a diagram that we see, or a short video clip rather, Here we have an amoeba as it uh, reaches out and takes in a, a yeast cell. Uh, this is a classic example of endocytosis. And really we see endocytosis happen in a couple different ways. Here are some examples. The first one is called phagocytosis. And that is actually, the, the word there means actually cell eating. And here's where we see the cell membrane reaching out and actually grabbing food particles wrapping around, just like we saw in that animation, or actually that, that short video clip of the amoeba, and then the membranes fuse together on the other end, and now you have a food vacuole with the food particles inside. The second is actually uh, similar, but in the opposite direction, where we have pinocytosis, where the membrane now contracts inward, and the particles that are outside um, move into that pocket, and that moves now to a, another food vesicle. vesicle. And this is usually used primarily for liquids. 
And then finally we have the last one, which is receptor mediated endocytosis. And these receptor particles right here are the important element. It looks an awful lot just like pinocytosis with these receptors and these receptor structures have uh, capture it seems or at least somehow interact with specific particles. And when those particles then uh, fill the receptors, the, uh, the pinocytosis, this endocytosis uh, takes place and now the cells guaranteed a certain quantity or certain particles associated with that. You can actually see electron micrograph structures here. Here's uh, phagocytosis uh, with a bacteria and, uh, and a amoeba. Here we see pinocytosis uh, with uh, water moving inward and then receptor mediated. It's much more difficult to see but I think you can make it out. So now this is your opportunity to summarize what you know um, about cell transport, particularly active transport. So answer the following question, what is the relationship between active transport and homeostasis of the cell or even the entire organism? Make sure you give one example of active transport in the organism and explain how the organism uses energy to maintain homeostasis. I hope this has been helpful.